Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, The Essentials of Estate Planning and Elder Law, presented by Elville and Associates Managing Principal and Lead Attorney Stephen Elville. My name is Jeff Stauffer, Community Relations Director with Elville and Associates, and I'll be moderating today's event. Welcome to everybody that is new to our educational webinar series and also to those that are frequent attendees coming back to see us. So when you have a question today for Steve, please note it in the questions panel on the right-hand portion of your screen and we'll take time throughout to address them. Your questions, as always, help the presentation and add value, they help others learn. So don't be shy in posing your questions at any time for Steve. Also, you receive the presentation by email from me to take notes on it if you wish. The presentation is also located in the section marked handouts in the panel on your screen to download at this time. For our professionals on today's webinar, welcome as well. For CFPs, CPAs, and others, you may receive 1.5 continuing education hours for attending. For my attendance records requirements, please email me your ID number as soon as possible so I can submit your CE hours for approval first thing Monday morning. Everyone will also receive a post-webinar feedback email right after the presentation, and we ask that you please take just a couple minutes to fill out this very brief survey to offer us your feedback about the presentation. And as always, we read and value every comment. Here at Elvon Associates, we want to be a resource to you for your families and your planning needs. So consider a consultation or a document review with Steve after today's presentation, and use today's education as a jumping off point to get your planning started or updated. Consultations are a great way to get your questions answered, have Steve understand your individual situation, and help create solutions and a path forward for you. So before we get started today, I'd like to offer Steve and the firm a brief introduction. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. So here at Elvin Associates, we were founded in 2010 in Columbia by Steve Elville. We have several different practice areas that we focus on here at the firm, including estate and special needs planning, elder law and elder care planning, estate and trust administration, business law and succession planning, guardianship and litigation, tax planning and asset protection. We have seven attorneys, 12 staff members in five locations. Steve and I are coming to you live from the Columbia Gateway Community location today. And it is raining as it has been for the past couple of days, but it's gonna get brighter out there. Our mission as it always has been and always will be is to provide practical solutions to our clients needs through counseling, education, and superior legal technical knowledge. And we do focus on education a lot here at Elvon Associates, and we do that in several ways. We do that through our planning processes with our clients. We offer over 100 educational webinars and workshops in the communities that we serve each year through all of our attorneys' work, including Steve's, who offers many, many of them. And also by way of our accredited client care program, or CCP as we call it here, we're one of only two firms in Maryland to have an accredited CCP through the Client Care Academy in Boston. We also work with the ideals of client education, collaboration, and compassion in mind with every client every day here at Elvon Associates. A bit about Steve, his work as an attorney for the past 20 plus years has been centered in elder law, special needs planning, and estate planning with an emphasis in the areas of tax planning and asset protection a member of many different national membership organizations, the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, the Academy of Special Needs Planners, the National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys, and many, many more. He works to bring peace of mind to clients by creating solutions to needs through counseling, client education, and the use of leading edge legal technical knowledge. A very seasoned speaker, if you haven't heard Steve present before, presenting at many webinars, workshops for businesses and their employees, conferences, and continuing education events each year. Steve was also named to the Maryland Super Lawyers List for an eighth time in 2023 and a seventh consecutive year. So congratulations to Steve. He also had a feature story written about him in a National Super Lawyers magazine about the Elville Center for the Creative Arts, which is our firm's charitable organization he founded in 2014. And I'm very privileged to be the executive director of so if you'd like to learn more about how we work to make a musical difference in the lives of children each day, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be very happy to share our story with you. But for right now, we are gonna talk about estate planning. 
another very important topic. Before we do that, I'm going to share a brief poll with everybody to see what has brought you to our webinar today. And the simple question is, what brings you to today's webinar? I'm going to go ahead and launch that. And the choices are, I'm new to estate planning and need to get started. Second, I have a plan in place, but it is outdated and needs to be updated. Third, I feel my plan is on solid ground, but education is always great. Very true. And lastly, I'm an advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. So make the choice that best suits you and Steve can tailor the presentation to who we have here today just a bit. And we'll give it just another 10 seconds or so. Everybody's slow on the button this morning. It's a rainy day out. Okay, 35% say I am new to estate planning and need to get started. 23% say I have a plan in place, but it is outdated. 17% say I feel my plan is on solid ground, but education is always great. And 25% say, I'm an advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. So thanks for participating. Steve, I'm going to make you the presenter. Thank you, Jeff. Button pop up. All right. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to get my self situated here and share my screen and start my slideshow. Looks good. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, sir. And thank you for that introduction. And good morning, everyone. And as Jeff said, it's a rainy day, but I sure do appreciate it. And we appreciate you participating and spending your very valuable time on a Friday morning. Happy Friday to all of you, uh, whether you are an advisor, a CPA, or a lawyer, or uh, an, an individual who's looking to increase their knowledge or learn about estate planning. We welcome you. And we thank you for not only being here, uh, and it's my privilege to be able to teach this morning. We love to teach and to present and to share information, but you are actually making it possible for me and Elville and Associates to fulfill our mission, which is to educate clients and to help make their planning work. So we thank you for that privilege. And I wanna thank Jeff, uh, my longtime colleague and friend for helping me uh, put on this webinar this morning. If you've never been on one of our webinars, Jeff is an expert and uh, uh, moderation of the, of the event and he will help take questions. We're going to stop informally at times to allow you to ask questions, and we're here to be uh, a resource to you. This presentation is, in essence, the uh, compilation, I should say, of my entire experience in estate planning, elder law, and special needs planning, all packed into maybe an hour and 15 minutes. We want you to use this as a resource. We want you to use the actual presentation as a reference point, because if you get the gist of most of this, you're going to know 95% more than anyone you know about estate planning and elder law. Uh, most likely that's the case. Uh, but we at Elville and Associates do so much education, we know from our side of the table here, we know that um, it's possible for someone to be overeducated in the sense that you could become overwhelmed by this information. And we don't want to do that. We don't want the education to become a stumbling block. So what we're going to do this morning is not only educate you, but have a healthy awareness that education is only one piece. And we also have to have paths to move forward. We want to help you be able to either update your planning or be able to implement planning and actually have this way forward to be able to do that and not just to have uh, all of this education for education's sake only. So hopefully we're going to strike a happy medium there. And I wrote a blog recently that I'm sure Jeff would be happy to share with you. And it really was just saying, just do your estate planning. So as you look to this very, very big uh, catalog of information I'm going to give you this morning and these concepts, I hope after all is said and done, that you will also read this blog if Jeff will send, kindly send it out again and just do your planning and not 
be striving for perfection. A lot of what we're sharing here this morning is not only the basics of estate planning, but also how to avoid mistakes in planning. Uh, but all that said, we just simply need to get started and we can perfect our planning as we go along. We don't have to have it perfect from the beginning. So with that introduction, I thank you again for being here and we're going to get started. Of course, everything that I'm sharing today uh, is not to be construed as legal advice. Uh, we are oftentimes asked questions on these webinars and I'm going to do my very best to give you general answers but because I don't know your individual situation and you haven't actually engaged an attorney, uh, we, we are, or engaged us as attorneys, we can't actually construe this as legal advice. But with that said, for educational purposes, I'm going to be sharing lots of information, including answering as many questions as I possibly can. So let's talk about estate planning and what it really is. That's one of the main uh, issues today that we're gonna cover. But as part of that, what is the process? And I'm going to be emphasizing that word process because if we don't have a process in planning, whether that's tax planning or financial planning or special needs planning or what other kind of planning that you may do for a vacation, whatever it may be, if we don't have process, then we have at least some degree of randomness and randomness is our enemy in estate planning. So we want to always go uh, along the lines of a process. Estate plans can ultimately not work the way that we envision. Now, this is a negative thing that I many times bring up because we want to understand that estate planning must be carefully maintained and thought about. It can go in a different direction than we intended, and we don't want that. We're gonna be talking about wills versus trusts. This is one of the biggest uh, topics in America. Should I have a will? Should I have a revocable living trust, which is a substitute for a will? And the underlying conversation there really is, should I have a probate plan or should I have a non-probate plan? So we're gonna talk about this. Many of you on this webinar this morning may have a revocable trust or a will already. We're gonna talk about that issue. Then we're gonna to transition to elder law, some fundamentals, what is it? Taxation asset protection, what are these concepts in today's world? And then as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about getting started and allowing you to have a path forward. So let's understand process and what estate planning really is. Well, to start to understand that, we want to have a plan and a purpose, a why. We want to have uh, a concept of what our goal is. One of the things I've learned after all these years is if I meet with a client and a client is willing to share their goals, now I know that we have communication and we can actually get from point A to point B. And I know this is very fundamental information, but it's very important to have a goal. And if you don't have a goal or know what that goal is, you just have an intuitive feeling that you should do your planning, I promise you that with the right amount of diligence, uh, you can achieve a goal, you can find your goal, you can have an epiphany about it in the process of counseling. We're also gonna talk about, you know, in the background after we have our goal and we're actually doing planning, we want to understand this unfortunate negative concept. Why do plans sometimes fail and what can we do to avoid that? Let's start right there um, where I just left off. The average person has no estate planning. So 55 to 62% somewhere in that neighborhood of people in the United States have no estate planning. That means that only a minority of people are doing estate planning, 45% or so. And of those 45% of individuals and couples who do estate planning, they don't do such a great job of updating that planning. So if you think about your tax planning and your tax filing, that's every year. If you think about financial planning, for those of you who have a financial advisor, I'm sure that you're revisiting those plans every year, at least, if not two or three times a year. But many people don't see estate planning in that way. So to make a very long story short, the average person who updates their planning now remember, most people have no planning. The average person who does have a plan 
and those are the minority of people, they only update that plan every 19 to 20 years. So that's a shocking statistic for most people. What we want to do, obviously, is not let 19 years go by from the time we do planning to the time we update our planning. And for those of you on the webinar who are the, those who have answered in the survey and say, you know, I have, a, I have an older plan and I'm thinking about updating it, I salute you because that is what you should do throughout your lifetime to make sure that your plan actually works. Now, all planning, again, is goal-driven. I'm repeating myself intentionally. Jeff and I say many times we are being intentionally redundant for the purpose of um, teaching and making sure that these concepts stick with you. So you might be planning because you very much love your, your, your loved ones, your family members. You want to provide certainty for them. And I should say right now, one of the big elements of estate planning is love, the underlying uh, emotional concept that's attached to estate planning. Not always, but most of the time, that is the fundamental premise of estate planning. Uh, facilitating smooth administration. You want the administration of your planning. When you are no longer living, you want that to be smooth. Uh, some people are focused on the cost of planning including the final administration. So some people want to minimize that overall cost. That can be part of a goal. Asset protection is a goal. I want to protect my spouse from the future claims of creditors or from a bad marriage if they should remarry or my children, grandchildren or nieces and nephews. We want to, to, to protect them from divorcing spouses, that kind of situation. Some people are focused on minimizing taxes. Many, many clients are focused on this, and that is part of good estate planning. Some people have special goals, whether they are charitably inclined or they have a, a, a child or a loved one with disabilities. We want you to think through these concepts and attain your own definition of planning. Now, again, this is a in the intentional redundancy. I'm focusing here on we have to have a plan. We have to have a goal, we have to have an idea in mind, and even if you don't, you can learn what that is. You can have an epiphany through counseling. But what you're, you're going to want to take away from this slide is that we want process. We don't want to focus on a stagnant set of documents. When you go to an estate planning attorney, or if you didn't go to an estate planning attorney and you just created some documents for yourself, we have a tendency as human beings to focus on those documents. This set of documents is my estate plan. I want you to get away from that notion. I want you to understand that documents just represent the tangible portion of the estate plan. But I want you to understand that there's an underlying intangible thing that goes along with estate planning that is based on these goals and values of yours and the only way to achieve that when we have this transient, transient life, right? We have this issue of constant change, health changes, political changes, tax changes and the laws. All of these issues with our loved ones and their continuing life process, estate planning documents need to be updated over time through a process. But the educational process when you are implementing estate planning documents or updating them is also important. So we know that 19 years go by on average for the average person to update their estate plan and we want to do better than that. We want to do much better than that. I'm going to argue that there are two types of estate planning. The traditional type that is focused on documents. There is uh, many disadvantages to this particular approach and many estate planning attorneys, including myself, we're trained in this fashion. But then as time goes by in someone like myself and my career, I learned that clients need more than just the traditional approach. They need a process-driven approach. And one of the things we do here is educate clients to understand the process, the reason for the process, and to also help their family members understand their roles, their responsibilities, and the process itself. So let's look at this briefly. 
the traditional method that many people like myself were trained to do basically is a stagnant process. There's no education. There is no process, so to speak, other than a very short initial process. Clients are not contacted again. There is no continuing education. So there's no maintenance and updating of the plan. This is the beginning of the problem. Now, remember from the opening remarks I've made to you, I promise that we're going to give you a ton of information today, but we don't want you to get bogged down in that information. We want you to be able to kind of take that for what it's worth, but then understand that you still have to engage in some path forward to get your planning in place. So here we could start to get bogged down, but just try to kind of take this in stride, if you would, uh, uh, on, a, on faith from me this morning, that this is just something you need to keep in the back of your mind. Now, if we can start implementing some kind of substantial process, we are doing much, much better in our estate planning. We can do much better than that one dimensional stagnant process where we're focused on documents. So we want to take plenty of time to design and implement the plan. That's the first phase. Whether it's a three-step process, whether it's a six-step process, doesn't matter. What matters is that we have a, a process that's focused on knowledge and education, okay, and counseling. So if you were to be willing to engage in a process, then again, lots of good things can happen. Uh, where clients and their attorneys are in partnership, now there's information sharing, there's idea sharing, and there is this ongoing synergy that leads to good planning. And then that process is implemented. Those plans are implemented. Then phase two is really the maintenance and updating of the plan. Now, nobody likes maintenance and updating except for some people. Some people enjoy maintaining their cars or maintaining their motorcycle or maintaining their, uh, their activities. But a lot of people in estate planning don't enjoy this maintenance process. But if we can understand that to really make our planning work, we have to maintain it over our lifetimes, then we can kind of accept this as part of estate planning that actually works. If we do steps one and two and we do them well, then at the time of our passing, hopefully many years from now, our estate planning will work the way it's supposed to. It will also work the way it's supposed to during our lifetimes because remember, estate planning is not just about what happens at death. It is about what happens during our lives should we become incapacitated. So we want to have a process and we don't want to be focused just on the tangible, visible results of the planning, which is the set of documents that we may have. So the process-driven plan incorporates you know, a process that includes education, a life process, maintenance and updating, education for not only the client and the spouse of a client, let's say, but for the children and other fiduciaries that are involved. Now, we're going through this in a methodical way. I want you to take your tablet or your piece of paper or your pen and pencil, and I want you to write what you think estate planning is about. So if you want to get a little bit interactive here, I'm going to give you a, bare, a very basic definition of estate planning, and let's just get right into that. Uh, this is a very simple but comprehensive definition. Estate planning is about disposing of or leaving your property to the persons or organizations that you want at the lowest possible cost. So let's, let's really drill down into this again. Estate planning is about disposing of your property the way you want. And this could be during lifetime, you could give away assets, or it's usually at death. So giving away the property to the persons or organizations that you want in the way that you want at the lowest possible cost. So if you think about that, that's a very succinct definition of estate planning. But each of you have a different set of family circumstances and individual life uh, circumstances and uh, goals and values and history that you are that you that make you who you are. And I want you to be thinking about what is my personal definition of estate planning? 
Okay, so that's kind of our first part of our presentation. Thank you for sitting through that. That's kind of the philosophical part and the preparation that I want you to be kind of internalizing throughout this, if you will. Now let's get into that big question that is asked across America, which is, should I have a probate or non-probate plan? So let's talk about wills. Wills are testamentary instruments. I create a will and that will says that at my passing, my property goes to the persons or organizations of my choice in the way that I want. And that's what we just said about estate planning. Now, wills by their very nature are subject to the probate process. I'm in Maryland. Uh, most of you probably are in Maryland and Maryland has a very robust probate process. What is that process in a nutshell? Well, this uh, brief slide uh, does not cover everything. It's a very broad topic, but this is a very simple explanation of a typical regular estate. This is an estate process where uh, the personal representative, the person who is in some states called the executor, opens an estate. They account for all the assets. They have to provide an inventory of the date of death values. Creditors have the right to make a claim against the estate and so forth. And then there's ultimately a final administration account, although in some st estates it's not required. And the cost is on average somewhere around 4% in Maryland. And that's because those are the statutory fees that are allowed. That doesn't mean it's going to cost 4% roughly. Uh, and let me give you those numbers for those of you who are making notes. So in Maryland, a um, the, the, in an estate, the statutory fees that are allowed are $1,800 of the first $20,000, $1,800 of the first $20,000, and 3.6% of the amount over $20,000. So you see, I'm just ballparking this at around 4%. In some states, it's more than that. Uh, New York, uh, North Carolina, California, uh, it may be more than that. So the average cost of probate is probably around 4%. But remember, that is only for probate assets. Let's discuss what probates, probate assets are. Probate assets are, for those of you who do not know, and I'm going to act as if you do not know this, but I know many of you do know this, um, probate assets are assets that have no joint owner of the person who died had no joint owner and that asset was in their sole name with no beneficiary. There's no joint owner, no beneficiary. So a good example of this would be a money market account. A money market account with $75,000 in it was in this person's sole name with no joint owner and no um, uh, beneficiary. So that is a probate asset. Now remember, that is a probate asset whether the person had a will or whether the person did not have a will. That is still going to be a probate asset. So a person does not have to have a will to be subject to probate. It's just that if they don't have a will, their estate will be distributed according to the laws of intestacy. So many of you are aware of that. Let's give a few more examples and then we will move on. If I have an IRA with a beneficiary, does that go through probate? And the answer is no. That is a beneficiary designated asset, no probate. If I have an IRA with no beneficiary, will that go through probate? And the answer is yes. Now, unfortunately, that pre-tax money on a traditional IRA is going to be subject to nearly immediate taxation in an estate. So that's a very bad situation. We want to make sure that our beneficiaries are correct, especially in the post-COVID world. Uh, if I have um, a, a husband and wife account, if we are married and we have a tenants, tenancy by the entirety spousal account, does that go through probate? And the answer is no, because that's the spousal form of joint ownership. So we have to understand what goes through probate and what does not, but the assets that are subject to probate will be subject to the court process. And if you look at the second bullet point here, what is the whole purpose of this probate court process? It is to make sure that the court approves not only the accounting, but the will is valid. It's a process of proving the will to be valid. So that is kind of the initial uh, discussion of probate. 
Uh, many of you have administered a probate estate as we start to look now at what a will-based structure looks like. Uh, here we have the will as the driving force. And of course, if I had a whiteboard here to be able to give you a few uh, illustrations, I would say this illustrates what happens at death, obviously. But if we look to the left and right of the will, we see that what we call in estate planning, the ancillary documents, the powers of attorney, the advanced medical directives, which have agents. And those agents are your trusted fiduciaries who will make your decisions and you are the principal. You are the person who gives them the power to act for you under certain circumstances. And by doing so, you are avoiding guardianship, which we're gonna talk about in a little while. So this is a basic will plan. The will is the driving force. Now, many of you have experienced being a personal representative or executor for a loved one or family member, and you know what this process is like. So it's a value-based thing and a personal thing to say, I want to avoid probate or not. Again, probate is public oversight. It is the process of proving the will to be valid. Now let's talk about a non-probate approach, and this is the alternative to a basic will, and this is the revocable living trust. Some of you have trusts, some of you have heard of trust, some of you don't understand what they are. I'll try to give you a brief explanation. So a revocable trust, in my view, is nothing more than a simple analysis of, I could have a will or I could have a substitute for a will. So it sounds very exotic, it sounds very complicated. I would like you to think about it as, it is a basic choice to avoid probate by using a trust as a substitute for a will versus just having a will. So a revocable trust is more private, it's kind of in the form of a contract. You can create this document that is private, uh, but it has two steps and the revocable trust has to be created. I would visualize this if you were drawing something on your notepad, I would draw a bubble or like a circle. That's my revocable trust. That's step one. I've created that trust. I've taken lots of time to design that trust and now I'm going to sign it. That's step one. Now, if we stop right there, we have a plan that won't work and we don't want that. So we're going to take step two, very important step two. And that is we take that trust and we transfer our assets into that trust. Real estate, such as your primary residence or a secondary residence, will go into this trust. Mutual funds, stocks, bonds, money market accounts, savings accounts, all of these things go into the trust. However, our retirement type assets, our 401ks, 403bs, 457 plans, IRAs, those do not go in the revocable trust because that would trigger taxation. So those stay outside the revocable trust. Life insurance, depending on how much, will stay outside the revocable trust and just be beneficiary designated. The idea that I'm describing here, uh, not so artfully with my hands, is basically that you must have those two steps under your belt or we don't have a revocable trust that will actually work. At Elville and Associates, we see many revocable trusts that are either um, improperly designed or they just weren't funded. They may be good documents, but the assets were never properly aligned and funded with the plan. So what we have there is a plan that won't work. So we don't want that. If you're going to do a revocable trust, we must take those two steps to have a trust that will actually work the way we want. Note on this slide that there is no asset protection, no creditor protection in a revocable trust. And there is no tax savings in the trust. Why? Because a revocable trust, as many of you may know, is nothing more, again, than a substitute for a will. So if we have this basic trust, it is nothing more than a reflection of yourself. So it's identified under your social security number. It does not have a separate tax ID number until you're passing many years from now, 
or on the passing of a spouse. And that means your tax filings remain the same. Nothing changes except the titling of certain assets. And at your passing, this avoids probate. So a revocable trust is a very nice tool. It is used many times to have great incapacity planning. It also is used many times in circumstances where family members are not getting along 100%. And there may be better uses for a revocable trust than a will. But it is basically, in a nutshell, a substitute for a will, and it is a basic choice in estate planning. Let's look at the revocable trust structure. Now, the revocable trust, as you see in this slide, has become the driving force of the estate plan. The will, as you see, if you look carefully, the will has now receded into the background. It is a backup document. And this is something we, in our estate planning world, call the pour over will. This is strictly a backup to the trust. Notice that the advanced directive and the power of attorney, that is still an integral part of the plan. And for those of you who are curious about this, if you're wanting to know what from an estate planning point of view do attorneys consider to be the most important of all documents, and it's the financial powers of attorney. This is not to say that the other documents are not important because they certainly are, but from a flexibility point of view, this is the most important document of all in the eyes of an estate planning attorney. Jeff, I'm going to stop for just a second to see if we have any uh, people that have questions on the call here this morning. Um, I thank everybody for their time and attention so far on this rather dense information. Thanks, Steve. We do have one question so far. Going back to the area surrounding uh, probates, and the question is simply cost of an executor. Thank you for that question. Um, the answer is, uh, unfortunately, somewhat ambiguous. Um, the executor is a person, as you know, who, who actually administers the, the estate, and they are entitled to commissions. Now, the way the laws have been for many years is that this statutorily allowed amount that I mentioned is really designed to be shared if this makes any sense, between the personal representative or executor, any professionals that are involved, like attorneys and so forth, uh, that's a shared fee unless the court approves additional fees. So what we want to do is understand that uh, when an executor or personal representative takes over an estate, they are entitled to compensation. And they could administer the entire estate without professionals. They actually could do that if they had the wherewithal to do that, and many people do. So I would say it's going to cost the estate the statutory amount if the personal representative uh, wants to take that amount and petitions the court for, for personal representatives commissions, or they're going to share a portion of that fee with the professionals involved, if there are professionals, or they will um, assign, let's say, the rights to all of the commissions and so forth to the professionals and not take a fee. So that's a, hopefully a good answer to that question. Yes, thank you. It appears those are all the questions for now. Thank you, Jeff. So now, having talked about wills versus trusts, let's talk about uh, other non-probate transfers. So if I were to draw some categories for you here, I would draw three categories uh, from top to bottom. I would say we have wills, and on the far category, we have revocable living trust. So right there, we have probate versus non-probate if we have a fully funded trust. And right in the middle, I would kind of put this category, other non-probate transfers. So this is very familiar to many of you, joint ownership, beneficiary designations, some of you know about life estate deeds. You can actually title a property in a life estate situation where it will pass with no probate to your beneficiary, so to speak, called remainderment. Transfer on death designations that we can do with our brokerage accounts at our financial advisory firms. Payable on death accounts from a bank account, let's say, where there's a beneficiary. In trust for accounts, which are similar to TOD or POD accounts. 
Why do most people not use this as their estate plan when we can avoid probate by having these transfers? Well, the answer is that you cannot ultimately control the flow of assets. Let's say that I'm a person and I have a transferable on death account. And I wanna stop here for just a second and say, our financial advisory colleagues, our financial advisor colleagues need to be very careful and clients need to be very careful to not do something with the client assets that are transferable on death and actually defeat the client's estate plan. So I'm gonna talk about that in just a second and I wanted to remind myself to make sure I talk to you about that. And this is gonna become more clear on the next couple of slides, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. We don't use these designations as the thrust of the estate plan. And the reason is that we want to make sure for most people that they have control of the contingent distributions and how assets are to flow if the unexpected happens. What if I have a child that I've left something, but that child has a disability at the time of my death because of a car accident or something that's an unexpected event? What if I've left assets to a beneficiary who passes away before I do? Probably not going to happen, but what if it does? And uh, I've made no contingency plans for that beneficiary's share because I've made everything payable on death or I've made everything transferable on death. This can actually cause assets to flow in a way that we may not have expected. So the reason why most people do not use this as the driving force, even though we as attorneys recognize that these are tools and we can use these tools in, in parts of elder care planning or special needs planning or even estate planning. So it's not as if they're not important. It's just that we should not view them as the means to an end for estate planning because they are one dimensional. Assets go from point A to point B with no contingencies, no what ifs. What if this doesn't work out this way? Now assets will be driven this way. Only through wills and trusts can you actually design these kinds of contingency provisions, which most people, thoughtful people would want. Here's an illustration of what I was saying just a moment ago. This slide and the next one illustrates that we, we can't just focus on documents, as I said from the beginning. We can have the best documents in the world, but if we have our assets flowing in a way that is not in co coordination with our documents, or they are not flowing uh, in conducive to the terms and provisions of the documents is another way of saying it. Now we will have an estate plan that surprisingly may not work the way we want. So the asset titling is extremely important. We can have the greatest will or trust in the world, but if our assets are titled in a certain way, it may defeat our estate plan. So let's say that I'm a client and I have a reason why I want to leave assets in trust for a beneficiary. This was very, very important to me. I was either protecting the beneficiary from themselves or I was trying to protect them from a, a, a divorcing spouse or I was trying to get money to flow into a special needs trust, whatever my goal was. But when I had my, my account at my broker dealer titled, it was titled as transferable on death and it went straight to the very person that I did not want it to go to. You see, uh, this may sound like an extreme situation, but we see this all the time. We see that someone has a great plan, a great intention, a great set of documents, but the assets are not flowing in the right way. So we want to make sure that this does not happen. How do we do that? Well, we want to develop not only education for ourselves, uh, not only education for our family members, but we want to have an advisory team. So if you're writing something down, I'd like you to write down the, the advisory team. And I want you to think in terms of your estate planning attorney, your financial advisor or advisors. I want you to think about a CPA if you don't have one. Many of you on this webinar may already have an advisory team, but it's not enough and we've got a separate webinar on this about how to achieve perfection in your estate planning, where we elaborate more on this, it's not enough to have an advisory team. We must have an advisory team that actually talks to one another.
and actually signs off and understands the overall plan. And this is where we can avoid the problems that are associated with the seemingly small things, but really huge things that can happen, like assets flowing in a direction where we didn't actually want them to flow. Okay, Jeff, you interrupt me at any time if we have questions, and I strongly encourage you to have questions. Let's now go into the nuances of incapacity planning. So I, I apologize in advance. This is tough stuff to walk through. I promise we will get through it, and I will keep it moving, uh, especially on a rainy Friday morning. We're talking about incapacity. So um, it's no secret. Jeff, do you have some questions yeah. there? Before we uh, dive into the... Uh incapacity planning area, we do have a couple of questions Thought we would try to get those accomplished before uh, moving on there. Um, so first question would be, what is the difference between a TOD and POD? Could you provide a definition? Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, a very simple definition is a TOD or transferable on death account is an account that you and I can establish at a broker dealer, typically like a investment firm, and they will allow us to establish a, let's say a brokerage account. At my death, that transfers on my death with no probate directly to a beneficiary. So that is a point A to point B, I've avoided probate um, designation. Now, uh, the POD is the payable on death designation, and in my experience, this is only offered through banks. And uh, the banks in a typical bank account type situation do not offer transferable on death. That is more of a, uh, of a brokerage type designation. But the bank account, I have, a, I have a savings account, I have a checking account, and I've made that payable on death to my loved one. That avoids probate. So that's the difference between those two things. Okay. Um, staying on that topic, um, can a TOD or POD designation be quote unquote undone with transferring the TOD slash POD asset to a trust accomplish that? Thank you for that great question. Um, POD is typically not allowed to go to a non-person. Now I'm going to put a big star beside that, a big caveat. Recently I have seen a couple of credit unions allow a payable on death account to be payable to a trust. But I've never seen that before in the last couple of years. Uh, typically, a POD account at a typical bank will not be allowed to be payable to a trust, but a TOD account can be payable to a trust, and that is a perfectly acceptable approach. Okay, last question for now. Would a step up in cost basis be applied for stocks or mutual funds passed to beneficiaries if accounts moved from deceased to beneficiaries through the revocable trust, like it would if it went directly from deceased to beneficiary? That's a great question. Thank you for that. It really helps our discussion. So this question has to do with uh, when I use a revocable trust, and I'm going to go ahead and throw in there, even though you didn't ask about this, a TOD account. If I use a TOD account, or uh, if I have a revocable trust and, and assets are in there, uh, non-retirement assets that have a basis like stocks or real estate, they will get a step up in basis in accordance with the code um, when the person dies. So yes, you would get a step up in basis for those types of assets. Uh, remember IRAs and 401ks have no cost basis in the same sense, so they don't get a step up in basis, but non-retirement assets would get a step up in basis just as if you had died with a will. Great question. Okay, very good. That's everything for now. Thank Cheers. you so much, Jeff. All right, thank you for that. And those questions really help us. So one of the things, of course, that's very important is you and I are hopefully very aware, and it's no secret that here at Elville & Associates, we've had many clients, dear clients, that have lived well beyond the age of 100. So we're living a long time. When we are planning, we plan not just for what happens at death, but what happens during life. And these documents, these incapacity planning documents cannot be understated uh, how important they are. So the advanced medical directive allows you to name your agents, to decide when the agent's power becomes effective, to customize that form. And we strongly recommend that you do. 
that you think through this issue. And Elville and Associates educates clients about these, these nuance issues. Uh, we want to know what your end of life decisions are. We want you to articulate whether or not your agent has flexibility, whether or not you want to give organ donation, all these things, including final arrangements. And in that process, you're waiving HIPAA. You're waiving the, your HIPAA rights to privacy at a certain point when your agents are serving or otherwise, you're gonna be thinking through all of these issues. But what most people don't realize is that these documents with allowing you to appoint your own private agents, your fiduciaries, you are the principal, you are allowing these people to serve for you and to manage your affairs. This avoids guardianship, guardianship of your person and on the financial side, avoiding adult guardianship of your property. As I mentioned earlier, arguably the financial power of attorney is from an attorney's point of, point of view, the most important, the most important document of all. Because in this set of documents, or depending on how many powers of attorney you use, in the modern practice, we may use two powers of attorney, the statutory form and a general customized form that really covers more advanced estate planning powers. You can articulate your vision and most people don't think about this, which is why we do educate many clients on these issues. Uh, they, it allows you to articulate your vision of how much or how little flexibility that you want to provide to your agents. And remember that if you're blessed and you are fortunate enough to have a family where everyone gets along, which is not always the case, then we strongly encourage you to, to use a lot of flexibility in the planning so that your agents have lots of choices that they can implement for you in the future. But this is a counseling issue and flexibility is not for everyone. The underlying theme of this slide is to make you aware that you're avoiding guardianship of your person and property to the greatest extent possible by having powers of attorney, advanced directives, and appointing your trusted agents. I mentioned just very briefly that Maryland has its own statutory forms now. This has been since 2010. The, the laws in Maryland for powers of attorney were very suspect back then, and they strongly needed revision. The Maryland Power of Attorney Act solved that problem, and it continues to evolve. I'm not going to put you through every single slide here, but I want to make you aware that the statutory powers, the statutory forms are very good, and they are enforceable by law. This is a very big thing that should give you peace of mind. When you implement a Maryland statutory form, your agent can enforce that by law, even at the penalty of attorney's fees. And that is a good thing for clients. But these statutory forms may not be enough to accomplish the advanced estate planning many of you need. So they are very good, but they are not necessarily customizable and many times we need to use a general power of attorney in addition to this. So for those of you who want to use this presentation as a resource, I'm just going to page through here just very quickly so that you can see that there are many enhanced powers that you may wish to customize for yourself and for your own goals in this process. And again, I apologize to those of you who may find this a bit uh, surprising that we're focusing so much on the financial powers of attorney, but that is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, in estate planning. And, and if you are somewhat surprised, I'm glad that you're getting this feel today for this. Some people say, Steve, that's not the most important document. My advanced directive is my most important document. So I want you to take this slide and just kind of take the ball and run with it, so to speak, as far as you want about customizing your own individual desires and preferences into an advanced directive. There is no one form. There is no such thing as the advanced directive. The advanced directive is somewhat informal or to a great degree informal, and you should feel free to customize the Maryland form or the five wishes form that you may see on the internet. We recommend the Maryland st uh, statutory form from the attorney general not only because it's easy to use and it's understood and accepted throughout the Maryland, DC, Virginia area, uh, but it's also 
uh, customizable, and it's got lots of places where you can input your own personal preferences. So remember, your loved ones, your agents, they're only going to know what you want if you make it clear, what you made clear verbally during your lifetime, and uh, what you may choose to customize here in this form. So again, we strongly recommend it. Uh, this is very, very personal to you. The most form is the Medical Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, which is called POLST in some states. Maryland requires this form. We strongly recommend that you understand the difference between the Advanced Medical Directive and the MOLST form, and we have some webinars that go into more detail about this subject. Uh, this is going to be subject to your age, your health, the advice of your doctor uh, or nurse practitioner, and um, we're just going to leave that where it is. This information is available to you on the Attorney General's website if you are so inclined, and Jeff and I are happy to send you some advanced information on the most situation if you're interested in finding out more about Maryland healthcare decision making. Okay, again, I appreciate your time and attention this morning through all that. Now I'm going to shift gears. We have about 20 minutes left in the presentation. Uh, the current tax environment for estate planning. Uh, many of you are aware, but some of you are not, that we're living in a world right now of extremely favorable policies and laws with regard to estate planning for taxation purposes. You, each of you on this call, if you're a U.S. citizen, you have a $12,920,000 exemption from federal estate tax. If you had not heard, heard that before, I'll repeat that. You did hear me correctly. $12,920,000 of estate tax exemption. If you are married, you have nearly $26 million, two times that amount, that you can leave your loved ones with no estate tax for federal purposes. Maryland has a $5 million exemption for state estate tax. And of course, we have an inheritance tax in Maryland, but that is not going to apply to lineal descendants and spouses and so forth. So it's non-lineal descendants that that will apply to. But what I want you to take away from this is we have a tremendous environment, and I apologize to those who are single on this webinar. The next few bullet points here have to do with marriage. So if you are married, we have tremendous flexibility in how to leave assets to each other for estate tax purposes. The survivor, if one of you dies, the survivor has five years. This is a very favorable policy. It used to be two years, and prior to that, it was only nine months to elect what is called the portability election. So if you are a surviving spouse, you have five years to choose now, I would not wait five years if I were you. That's another story. But you have five years to choose the $12 million exemption, the $12,920,000 exemption of your deceased spouse to use that for yourself in addition to your own exemption, whatever that may be at your death, and for Maryland to port the $5 million of your deceased spouse over to yourself so that you could leave up to $10 million with no tax. Now, some of you on the webinar here this morning may say, Steve, well, I don't have uh, 10 million or 5 million. I don't even have 26 million. Why would I use portability? This is going to be a case by case basis, but it could be advisable on the death of one of you, if you're married, that you should elect portability if for no other reason than to make sure that the government can never take away the exemption of your deceased spouse. So this is a counseling issue. Uh, it's something that you should strongly consider, in, in my opinion, to at least be counseled on the death of a spouse. Marital control. Some people want to leave assets outright to their surviving spouse with no controls. Other older couples, many of them want to make sure that if I leave assets to my surviving spouse, they are controlled in a way that it is protected from a new spouse, and I want to make sure those assets go down to my loved ones at the death of my surviving spouse. So this kind of marital trust kind of uh, planning is something that is a counseling issue, and we need to be aware of certain laws that protect spouses that could thwart our estate plan, and we're gonna talk about there, that in just a few minutes. Now I'm going to shift into more of the elder law uh, type of pre uh, information here in the presentation. 
Because what we're really seeing as we start to look at this slide is that we have routine estate planning for many reasons, to accomplish goals of all kinds, and we have probate, non-probate, we have incapacity planning, we have all of these things. Now we have this confluence of where does regular estate planning stop and well, where does elder care planning begin? So this is one of the big questions. What is elder care planning? And I like to describe this as uh, it's really not a mystery. It's just a, 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 a kind of a product of demographics. So, so many people in America in the, in the 90s started to become aged in a sense of people over 55, 60, 65 years old, and an entire practice area developed called elder law. And the difference is that the elder law person, the person who is, who is interested in elder care, I should say, and counseling, their needs are changing. They are transitioning from regular estate planning into what I would call disability planning. How do we deal with long-term care? How do we uh, deal with nursing home contracts or assisted living contracts? How should I approach having enough flexibility in my plan? What about special needs planning? What if my spouse has a long-term illness? So this is the juxtaposition where one's, one kind of planning stops and the other planning begins. So sometimes this can happen in the same representation. Sometimes it happens years later. Asset preservation is one of the big questions. How do I preserve assets? How do I have enough flexibility? How do I divest assets? Remember that we can't preserve assets for Medicaid purposes for looking at the big Medicaid umbrella that is over uh, the world of elder care, which pays for about 85% of long-term care. How do we think about divesting assets and is that a good idea for us? So remember, we have to divest assets in some way, give them away if we're going to protect them for elder care or long-term care purposes. And there are methods to be able to do that with Medicaid trusts and planning for veterans benefits where we are giving away those assets, but we are kind of doing it in a way where we still maintain some control, which is advisable, but not always the, is going to be the choice of clients, but it's advisable. Uh, and also uh, having some ability to still benefit from those assets. And so that's a very nuanced area of the law, but we don't want to generally give away assets with no control and no recourse for ourselves. So this is a very goal specific thing. Someone who wants to divest assets is someone who feels very strongly about uh, that issue and trying to put assets out of reach of a Medicaid spend down five years in advance. Now I promised before I go into uh, asset protection, I promised to talk about the issue of remarriage. It's important to understand that as of October, 2020, surviving spouses have many, many more protected rights than they did in the past. For most of you who are traditional couples and loving families, this is not going to have any big impact on you. But remember, when we're talking about remarriage protection, which is an, another nuanced subject, that it's important to understand the use of prenuptial agreements if you are a surviving spouse or become a surviving spouse and you decide to remarry you must remember that your new spouse has many more rights in Maryland and it could affect your estate planning. So that is something that you want to be aware of. Now, as we spend the last 10 or 15 minutes of our presentation, we want to get into now the area of asset protection. I like to break this down into three categories so it doesn't become so overwhelming because not all asset protection is the same. Let's look at lifetime asset protection. And the, much of this slide has to do with married couples. So again, I uh, apologize to the single people on the line here this morning. Uh, lifetime asset protection is not something that most people are thinking about for elder care, but it's very important for you to understand for all planning. If you are married, you probably own your residence as tenants by the entireties. You have a basic form of asset protection, even though that form of asset protection does not protect 100%. It kind of is the fundamental foundation of asset protection for spouses. Life insurance is protected from the claims of creditors, 
as long as a spouse or child is the beneficiary. Annuities are protected from the claims of creditors for the same reasons. Qualified plans and IRAs are protected from creditors as a general rule of thumb, especially qualified plans. Back to the top, tenants by the entireties. I failed to say that if you have non-retirement assets that are not titled as tenants by the entireties and you are a couple, it could be a good idea to make sure that all of your non-retirement assets are titled as tenants by the entireties. There are exceptions to that. There might be reasons not to do that for tax basis purposes and other things, but that is a good educational piece for you to remember. Uh, many people do not know that, and that's a very a nuanced issue. Many of our financial advisory friends and colleagues uh, need to be more focused on this issue for their clients. If you are leaving an IRA to a loved one other than your spouse, and um, you know we are hoping to have asset protection for those IRAs, those are not protected from the claims of creditors. So our IRAs and our qualified plans during our own lives are generally protected. But when we leave an IRA for a loved one, that is not going to be protected unless we leave it into a trust. Now we're back to elder care again, asset protection in elder care. So we talked about asset protection during lifetime. Here is asset protection for elder care purposes. The Medicaid Asset Protection Trust is a tool that the elder law community, the elder law bar in the US developed over long periods of time since around 2005. This is arguably the most powerful tool in estate planning overall because it is a hybrid trust that allows someone to divest their assets, whether it's a couple or an individual, to transfer their assets to a trust like this and, and maintain income tax advantages and also maintain at least a small amount of control or what we would say in law is a modicum of control and also retain the step up in cost basis, which one of our nice listeners brought up. The Veterans Trust, the Veterans Asset Protection Trust is another hybrid tool that we use in estate planning. And this could be for the person who they themselves want to become eligible for the VA pension, the VA aid and attendance pension, even though the Veterans Administration has many pensions, uh, or this could be the spouse of a qualified veteran. The use of trusts under wills. This is a very essential strategy for you to understand if you are a couple, a married couple. Uh, if one spouse becomes impaired or has a long-term progressive illness, this strategy is a strategy that may help preserve assets where unfortunately a well spouse might die first. So unfortunately that does happen, doesn't happen very often, but it does happen and many couples want to be very proactive, and this is an essential strategy. The augmented estate is a fancy way of saying what I had mentioned earlier about the new marital laws that protect spouses. But from the elder care context, Maryland has given its blessing and uh, codified this approach, where if one spouse is the well spouse and actually dies first, they can leave assets into a further trust for their, their sick spouse or ill spouse, and those assets will be protected against Medicaid spend down. And this augmented estate bullet point here has to do with the fact that Maryland cannot recover, has agreed not to recover against the estate of that person as long as we make sure the strategy is implemented correctly. So this is a wonderful thing. The five-year look back period, I want you to think about that as a five-year look forward period. I want you to think in terms of if I were to decide to divest assets, to give them away in some form or fashion, then I want to understand uh, how that works. If I don't apply for Medicaid within five years of the time of that divestment, uh, what happens? And basically we want to understand this strategy we want to understand when it's best to do it and when it's best not to do it, and what happens if we don't get through the five-year period. This is all the elder care asset, uh, asset preservation conversation. The rule of hands has to do with a strategy that says, well, if I have basic documents in place, if I have the flexibility in place of my very robust powers of attorney documents, 
If I become ill and I did no advanced, no exotic elder care planning, this allows under the current law, my fiduciaries through proper counseling and strategy to preserve up to half of my assets, uh, no matter what, under certain circumstances. So this is an important thing to understand. And then life estate deeds are a simple method, although they don't provide the flexibility we're really looking for. The life estate deed is a way to give up control of a property, still be able to live in it, but at your death, if you can get beyond the five-year period, there is no Medicaid look back. And if you don't die, uh, it and you're beyond the five-year period, it allows your property to be free of a Medicaid lien. So there are very, very simple techniques like that, and then more complex ones that provide you with more flexibility. And as we really get towards the end of our presentation now, I wanted to cover this slide, which has to do with the third category of asset protection. We talked about lifetime asset protection, elder care type asset protection as an overview, and now asset protection at death protecting the shares of spouses, children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, whoever we wish to protect. So this kind of planning is basically design driven. It's very effective. Uh, it allows for what we call spendthrift protection. The beneficiary is protected from the claims of creditors, divorcing spouses, bankruptcy creditors and so forth, car accidents. This could be something that is a goal of yours. Um, Structuring trustees is hugely important. Uh, Jeff and I have done many webinars. We did one yesterday with a financial advisory firm yesterday about um, structuring trustees and trustee selection. Probably the hottest topic in estate planning today is who's going to be my trustee and how do I select them? Uh, whether the beneficiary should remain in control of the, any part of the process. This is something that can be designed. Uh, whether to use a special fiduciary called a trust protector. This would allow you to leave a long-term trust for someone, but still build in a certain amount of flexibility for the long-term, given the changing world that we live in. Giving powers of appointment. Do we give beneficiaries the right to redirect the property in a certain direction down the road, whether this is a spouse or a child or other beneficiary? This is really a question of your wishes, but it also has ramifications for asset protection and uh, estate tax. Special needs beneficiaries, obviously, is very important to protect vulnerable loved ones and protecting them at death in special needs trusts, or what we might call, in many cases, supplemental needs trust, is a really important type of planning that has to do with protecting beneficiaries. So we want you to know there's many, many options here. If you're willing to kind of sit through this kind of education, you can really design some wonderful things uh, and provide flexibility at the same time. The SECURE Act, many of you now are familiar with this. Uh, the SECURE Act was signed by President Trump in, in late uh, 2019 and became law in 2020. It affects most estate plans, not all, and it has to do with, on one hand, expanding retirement plan savings in this country, but on the back end of this act, it actually hurt people like many of you or I who want our children or beneficiaries to be able to stretch out the taxation of IRAs when we leave the IRA to them. So there are only five exceptions to this, and that is spouses, uh, siblings or beneficiaries that are less than 10 years younger than you, that's a strange exception, uh, minor children, chronically ill people and people with disabilities like special needs beneficiaries. Those five types of beneficiaries are exempt from the SECURE Act and they can still stretch out their IRAs when you leave those to them for their life expectancy like we always could. But all other beneficiaries, which are the vast majority of people, they cannot do that. And many of you have heard they must take those distributions and pay all the tax within 10 years. There are strategies to deal with the SECURE Act. Uh, there are ways of thinking about it. There are ways to try to mitigate its uh, effects, but it's not easy and all plans need to be reviewed uh, for the SECURE Act. Elville and Associates now, as we really wrap up, has a client care program. Uh, we are one of the only firms in Maryland that has an accredited client care program. All this is is really a reminder to you that education is important, 
education of your family members and fiduciaries is important, updating is important, and this is what we're trying to do, and I won't take you through every single slide, but our belief is that if you're willing to engage in the educational process, your plan will actually work, and we offer a client care program as a tool for you to use and for your family to use to continue to be educated and have your planning updated and try to make sense of uh, continuous updating despite the crazy world that we're living in. And Jeff can provide more information about the client care program to you. And Jeff, you probably should send that out today. And as we wrap up, and I thank you for your very kind attention and time this morning on a Friday morning. I know you're very busy. We, we want to again offer you this path forward. We don't want to just educate for the sake of educating. We want to make sure that you have a path forward. Complete, as a, complete an estate planning questionnaire if you're considering this. This gives us a lot of information. And it's very strange, we know, to share information with people you've never met before, such as the folks here at Elville and Associates. But we want you to know that everything is confidential. If you meet with an estate planning attorney, you are actually entering into an attorney-client relationship, a confidential relationship, even if you decide not to move forward with that attorney or Elville and Associates in this, in this instance. So there's nothing to fear. Everything is confidential. And we want to see your existing estate planning documents. If you're a person on this call who has existing plans, we would love to see those. And generally, we do not charge to review existing estate planning documents. We want to see where you've come from and what you are dealing with. We want you to have an advisory team. If we can be helpful to you to uh, help develop that team, or if you have maybe one member of the team, but you don't have others, we have lots of suggestions for you and trusted people that you could interview and see if you were comfortable uh, dealing with them and help you have an advisory team that actually works. Just like you did today, we love to answer your questions. So please come if you do with questions. We're here to help. And we have high-tech conference rooms here at Elville & Associates. We have electronic whiteboards. We have just an environment where we hope that you will have the time to think, to leave your busy lives behind and to come and focus and be able to decide what is important to you. And uh, that's one of the things we really want to accomplish is giving you the time to think. So we invite you to uh, let us know what you want from us as far as information or a consultation. And uh, Jeff can send out whatever supporting information that you may need. And you can contact him or my executive assistant, Mary Gay Kramer. And again, I thank you for your willingness to be educated and to sit through this rather dense information. I've enjoyed it very much. And Jeff, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thanks, Steve. Um, as always, um, really great information to share with our clients and the communities that we serve out there. Um, I wouldn't call it dense information. I've heard it a thousand times and it never gets old. So. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, so um, now would be your time to get your questions into Steve. Um, if you have any last minute questions that um, you want to get in, you've got Steve right here in front of you, literally. Um, so please go ahead and get those final questions that you have on your mind in, as I have a couple uh, final words um, as always here. So um, our webinar series uh, moves on. Um, and next Wednesday, we have a new topic, um, cryptocurrency. What in the world is cryptocurrency? You're going to find out on Wednesday, um, cryptocurrency gaining an understanding and making informed choices. So that will be something interesting. I'll be listening intently. Uh, Thursday, Medicaid long-term care asset protection planning. That is next Thursday. And then on March 1st, we are bringing back understanding a state and trust administration. And uh, we're looking forward to all three of those very much. Uh, as far as follow-up from today, um, I'll be sending out today's video, uh, information about the MOLST form, um, also some additional information about our client care program, which means very uh, a great deal to us here at the firm. Um, Steve alluded to the uh, blog and article that he wrote recently, uh, Just Do Your Estate Planning, which I will send out as well, and some links to other estate planning focused webinars that we have done recently here at the firm as well. Um, so with that said, let's check to see if we have any other questions. 
and um, some thank yous from some people. We always appreciate that. Uh, it's our pleasure. Uh, let's see here, receiving a copy of the slides. Um, as always, I will send that out in the follow-up message as well. Thank you for that reminder. Um, let's see here, it looks like a couple other questions. Um, Steve, what are your thoughts on TOD coupled by incorporating the term herstirpes? Yes, thank you for that question. I think that's going to be driven by what forms are available from the various brokerage firms. I still would uh, argue that that's certainly better if that's allowable uh, in that particular circumstance, but I think it still doesn't provide for the contingencies that are available in the various planning documents. So again, this is all situational and it's not wrong to, to do a TOD designation directly. It's just that we have to understand that if circumstances change beyond our control, the assets might flow in a direction that we never thought about uh, through the laws of intestacy or other types of uh, circumstances. But uh, I think that's gonna be driven by, by the form that's available. Okay. And it looks like last question for now, what is the cost of an initial consultation? Thank you for that. Uh, we don't charge for estate planning consultations. Um, clients uh, come in, potential clients come in with questions about estate planning and wills and revocable trusts and even reviewing uh, older plans. Uh, many times we do have to charge for certain consultations that have to do with crisis situations in elder law uh, and other situations, but for special needs planning and regular estate planning, we have no consultation fee. Uh, so thank you for asking that. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. So it looks like those are all the questions for now. Thank you for the questions. Um, Steve said we living in a changing world, but one thing that uh, doesn't change here is um, you know, the legal advice that we offer, which is always very sound, um, counseling, education. And um, so we appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you here at the firm sometime soon and as well on our Elville webinar series. And we hope you have a great weekend too. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you.